You mentioned type 1 diabetes and DKA. So what is diabetic ketoacidosis? What are the telltale signs of type 1 diabetes? And how would you treat such a patient? Okay, so um, in pediatrics, you usually get diagnosed with type 1 as a kid. What I train people to look for is polydipsia, polyuria, and polyphagia. What that means is you're drinking a lot, you're eating a lot, you're peeing a lot, but you lose weight. That is because the way DKA happens is that effectively you lose all your insulin. You're eating, you got plenty of sugar in your blood. In fact, you got so much sugar in your blood, your kidney can't reabsorb it all, so you're getting dehydrated. Thus, the lots of drinking and lots of peeing. But because you have no or very little insulin, your body can't use the sugar that's there. It can't get from the bloodstream into the cells. And your brain is like, I need something. I'm not getting the sugar I'm supposed to get, so give me something else. And what happens is your body goes into a state of starvation. Even though you're eating, even though you've got lots of sugar, the body thinks it's in starvation, so it releases free fatty acids from everywhere. And that's an attempt to feed your brain. Diabetic, that is, you have diabetes, so sugar is high. Keto acids, that is, the fatty acids that are released to replace the source of fuel for your brain. And then the acidosis is because those keto acids build up, the pH of your blood drops. Now, DKA itself is a life-threatening emergency. Drinking a lot, eating a lot, peeing a lot, and losing weight anyway are the signs of someone who has new onset type 1 diabetes. You can make the diagnosis and intervene before DKA. Someone who has type 1, who doesn't get intervened on in time, or someone with type 1 who doesn't take their insulin, their bodies don't make, pushes themselves into the state of starvation, and they go into DKA. They will also experience polyepsia, polyuria, polyphagia, eating a lot, drinking a lot, peeing a lot. And when their pH begins to go down, they don't know their pH is down. I do, because they stick a needle in their wrist and draw out their blood. As they get acidotic, as they continue to starve, their brain doesn't work, they get confused. And eventually will go into a coma. Coma is the next stage closest to death. As a paramedic, we were trained to try to smell that juicy fruit or the really sweet odor of DKA. I don't smell that well, but some people can do it. More importantly, eating a lot, drinking a lot, peeing a lot, but feeling the fatigue, confusion, and eventual coma are the signs of someone in DKA. If you get, come in in DKA, we will stratify how bad you are based on the pH level of your blood, how confused you are, and how much fluid we need to fix things. If you're in a coma or your pH is less than seven, you are the most severe you can get before death. If you are not so confused but a little off and your pH is between 7.0 and 7.2, you're still going to the intensive care unit. If someone manages to come in a little early, that is their pH is between 7.2 and the normal 7.4 and they are not confused at all, but they have some of these keto acids floating around their blood, their sugar is high, we may be able to get by with giving someone a bunch of fluid and some insulin. But at that point, the DKA stage, the life-threatening emergency, you're being hospitalized, you get IV insulin, not just sub-Q injections, and a ton of volume because you are so dehydrated from the loss of sugar in the kidneys, and your brain and other all organs are starving for energy. We have to give you the volume, give you the insulin, and usually, this is confusing, once we get the sugar down to a certain level, you still need the insulin to correct the acidosis. It may even add sugar to the fluids towards the end. Okay, so you touched on insulin here, and I think this is a, this is a really important topic here. In the, in, the, in the case of type 1 diabetes, most people who are diagnosed uh, in, the, in the early stages of their diagnosis, they want to get off of insulin as much as possible. So they do everything they possibly can, and they oftentimes adopt a low-carbohydrate diet in order to reduce their insulin exposure or the amount of insulin they need. Uh, we try and teach people insulin is not your enemy. It's a required biological hormone required for life. Can you go into a little bit of detail here into why uh, it's important to understand that insulin itself is not necessarily a dangerous hormone, but it's actually required for life? Sure. And actually that, that perception, insulin is scary. Everyone has it. Either it's a sign of failure because you couldn't control your disease 
or what people learn is, well, if I take too much, I die from a low blood sugar. And so that uh, baseline, um, that tagline, people hear and they're like, well, I'll forget it. I don't want to die. The problem is, especially with type 1s, in type 1 diabetes, you can't make any insulin, right? There's autoimmune destruction of the cells of the pancreas that inherently make insulin. And so if you don't have insulin making cells, you literally cannot make any. Now there's obviously variations, but let's just say type one has no insulin production from their pancreas. You need sugar to live, right? We just talked about DKA, fatty acids cause a problem. So the brain, the muscles, all of your organs need sugar. So you eat them. If your body doesn't make any insulin, none of those organs can get the sugar. Right? In order to get from the blood into the cells, insulin has to act. So if you have no insulin, you can have plenty of sugar in your blood, but none of your cells are getting it, and that's what pushes you to DKA. Insulin is mandatory. You have to have it. But in type 1s, they make none. So you have to then supply it exogenously, that is through injections. Now, um, it can be, get very complicated, right? And what the way the, a normal pancreas without type 1 diabetes works is there's always a little bit of insulin around, and that keeps your blood sugar stable. When you eat something, your blood sugar begins to go up, and a normal functioning pancreas says, whoop, hey, blood sugar is going up. Let's li excrete a little bit extra insulin to control that. When the blood sugar begins to come back down to normal, the extra insulin turns off. That's sort of the basal insulin always around and then the bolus insulin with meals. When we ask diabetics, especially type 1s, to inject insulin, what we try to ask them to do is to mimic what the pancreas normally does in a regular patient. That is, there's always a little bit of insulin around, that's your basal, once or twice a day, and then your bolus, which is prandial. And the problem is that a non-diseased pancreas has a sensor that says, ooh, sugar's too high, make more insulin. Ooh, sugar's going down, stop that insulin. You, the diabetic who's injecting, doesn't have that, right? So you just have to give yourself some. And so what we do is try to train people to get as close to what's needed. The idea is the insulin you take right now is going to cover the food you're about to eat. So you inject, eat. And if you're right, at the next check, your sugar is going to be in normal ranges. If you were wrong, you can't go back in time, right? What you can do instead is say, okay, well, I missed that. I didn't give myself the right amount for the food I was about to eat. So I'm going to give myself a little extra. Right? That's correctional insulin. So you give yourself the correctional insulin, and then you're about to eat another meal. So you have to give yourself some insulin for that meal. Now, in the very beginning of this process, it is literally guessing. There's some formulas out there that say, oh, maybe based on this weight, and blah, 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 blah. But what it comes down to is, you just try it and see what happens. And the more information you have, the more educated the guests, right? But how many carbohydrates are in your coming meal? What's your sensitivity? You start off at a number that's way, way below what you need. But then over time, you titrate it. You, you zero it in. And a couple times, you'll have a, a really high reading because you ate a cake and didn't give yourself enough. Or you gave yourself the cake dose and ate a salad. And you'll have a hypo. But then you learn from that and eventually you kind of, if you're doing it correctly, what you'll do is you'll have all these real, what, what, and then all of a sudden it'll start to even out and get, be controlled. The problem is that for a lot of people starting insulin, the idea of injecting insulin up to five times a day or more if you're going to be really savvy and pricking your finger as, as many times is sort of like, well, I don't want to do that, period. And then they hear, ooh, insulin could kill me. If I take too much, they say, forget it, no. Well, if the problem is that your body needs insulin to live, and while you don't have to do it five times per day, the whole point is to try to simulate what the regular non-diseased pancreas would do if it were working. And it's hard to do that, but with a little bit of training, you just start off taking the same amount. It doesn't matter if you're off. And then you sort of dial it in and get closer to the dose, you keep your calories the same, and you learn how to carb count, and you learn how to add extra, the correctional, and all of a sudden, after a couple of weeks or even months, you're so good at it, you kind of just look at the food, you know about how much, and you give yourself the right amount. But it does require a lot of vigilance. Now, type 1s must have insulin because they have none of their own. 
but the standard of care that we get taught is A1C over nine needs insulin. The thing is that type two diabetics have insulin resistance. They still make insulin. So we can get by with maybe not being as rigorous because we're not trying to emulate exactly what the pancreas does because the pancreas is already doing it. The higher the A1C, the more necessary insulin is because all the medications that we have, everything we do, basically mean either increased insulin sensitivity or somehow more insulin, except for those SGL2s we're talking about. And when it comes down to it, the way you control the blood sugar the best is with insulin. Now, uh, I don't know this, that was, I probably shouldn't go down to type two actually, because that, that's like brings up a whole lot of questions about like, you know, should you know, the risk of increasing to obesity and the cycle. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Should so probably leave the whole type two. Okay. But I mean, that's actually an important point though. I mean, I think you're on to something there. And then the myth people is that like, we're trying to say insulin's not the enemy because um, it, yes, it can lead to weight gain. But like, if, you, if you're a type two and your pancreas is exhausted and you need some like in the short term, it's not the end of the world. Like people, are, it's like, it can be a- That's a good message actually. That, that, that's, that, that fits right in. Like that's yeah. not what I would teach, but that's actually a good message for me to bring up here. Yeah. I can do that actually, yeah. Like, right. like, like the short, like, because, and, and so in reality, if you can put on insulin, you're gonna be in this vicious cycle where you are gonna gain weight, you need more insulin, and more weight, and more insulin, more weight, more insulin. Sort of actually for dose doctor, shush, don't point this out there. It's like we're gonna be recurring customers forever, right? We keep increasing their insulin, they keep going up in weight, they keep increasing their insulin. Like we'll always, we'll always have people that fall back out of, out of goal. But um, I think that in context of you guys, like actually it's important to say, well, if you need a little insulin to give your pancreas some help and implement the lifestyle changes yes. off it, that's actually really important. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's go back to, if you lose a lot of weight, you can probably reduce it, but classically what we get trained is an A1C over nine is going to require insulin. Now, insulin can lead to weight gain. And this is the people that, this, this is the part that scares people also. They hear that insulin causes weight gain. And since they've already been told weight gain caused their diabetes to begin with, they think, well, if I go on insulin, it's only gonna get worse. And that actually, brace for it, is true. If you do nothing else other than go on insulin, you are going to gain weight and your diabetes can get worse. Then that'll increase your insulin requirements. But here's the thing. If your A1C is over nine, the risk to your eyes, your kidneys, your feet, your heart, your brain, your life is so elevated that it doesn't matter. We just have to control the blood sugar, reduce the risk of all that. The damage done is done. And you can, you can reverse the damage to your, your capillaries, your arteries. You can't undo the heart attack or undo the stroke, but you can significantly reduce the risk of those things happening in the future if you control your blood sugar. In the short term, controlling your blood sugar must be done with insulin. A1C over nine, especially in the double digits. There's nothing you're going to do in the short term that's going to get adequate control of that blood sugar. That sucks to hear, right? It's like, well, I, I didn't know my diabetes was that bad. Now I have to prick my finger and stick a needle in my belly. Well, yes. Right? The question is, do you want to feel a little pinprick or do you want to have a stroke? The good thing, though, is that once the blood sugar is controlled, if you do more than just the insulin, right? if you do those dietary lifestyle changes, you can substantially reduce the amount of insulin you need you may not need to do it every meal and the basal bolus thing that we tell type ones to do. You may get it down to once a day. You may get off it. The problem is that you have to be aggressive with your lifestyle changes, with your diet and your exercise in order to undo that very high A1s, losing hundreds of pounds, completely radicalizing what you do in terms of lifestyle, which is really hard. And we don't have medically very, very many protocols or decent plans to get someone from an A1C of 12 to an A1C of seven any other way than insulin. So it becomes it's up to people who have, who have really good ideas and who are very willing and committed to a huge lifestyle change that can actually make that reversal happen. I say again though, type ones must have insulin because they don't make any of their own. They can reduce the amount of insulin they need but a type 1 diabetic should be committed to a lifetime of injecting insulin.